Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and get started. And then if anyone's joining late, hopefully they can see the recording of this presentation just in case they meet, miss anything. So my hello, uh, welcome to today's webinar, Less is More, Building to Zero Energy, Water, and Carbon, which is part of the Department of Energy's Building Energy Codes Program 2022 Summer Series. My name is Andrea Krim, and I am the Building Policy Manager at the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships, or NEEP. This is the fourth um, event in the 2022 Building Energy Code Summer Seminar Series. Recordings and presentation slides of past webinars are available on energycodes.gov. And this series will cover, cover other timely topics such as what's new in the residential provisions of the 2021 IECC, advanced technologies, energy policies and resilience, and more. And looking ahead, there are two more events in the series coming up in the next few weeks as listed here. And so um, I'm going to now be giving a brief overview of NEEP before we dive into our presentations. So NEEP um, is one of six regional energy efficiency organizations, or RIOs, funded in part by the U.S. Department of Energy. And we, our territory in the NEEP region is Maine down to West Virginia, as well as Washington, D.C. So we encompass the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeastern states. And NEEP assists the region uh, to decarbonize and electrify the building sector. We provide technical assistance and resources to a wide variety of stakeholders. And so here's an overview of the presenters as well as myself, and we'll be giving their contact information at the end of the three presentations. And so now I'm going to give a quick overview of and background on today's presentations and focusing on zero energy, water, and carbon. And so reoccurring droughts, fires, severe weather, stressing electrical grids, and fluctuation in the energy costs have communities and individuals increasingly seeking out solutions to create more resilient homes and businesses. Highly efficient and resilient buildings that are energy, carbon, and water neutral have often been considered out of reach. But with new technologies and increasing energy and water prices, they are more attainable than ever. This session today will explore the current state of zero and identify the challenges holding us back and opportunities such as building energy codes pushing us forward. So what is the current state of zero in building energy codes? So the U.S. does not have a standardized approach to building energy codes. There is no uniform federal energy code. So these codes are developed by two trade organizations, the International Code Council, or ICC, which develops the International Energy Conservation Code, the IECC, and the American Society of Heating, Refriger Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, ASHRAE, which develops codes for commer commercial buildings. These are both updated every three years, with the latest versions being the 2021 IECC and the ASHRAE 90.1 2019. The IECC and ASHRAE codes are often called the model codes. So ba both base model codes do not currently contain zero energy provisions, which can be defined as provisions that require new buildings to demonstrate net zero energy use based on measured building performance outcome. But both codes do have optional appendices that states and municipalities can adopt that do provide provisions towards the design of zero energy buildings, such as the ASHRAE standard 189.1. Both the IECC and ASHRAE, however, have committed to publishing zero energy base codes by 2030. So model codes are expected to be zero energy codes, which within the next three public it, published iterations. There is some movement already of states in the NEEP region moving towards zero energy building codes, including Washington DC's Appendix Z, which is the district's net zero energy alternative compliance pathway for commercial buildings, and Massachusetts Municipal Opt-in Zero Energy Stretch Code, which is a new opt-in stretch code that is expected to be adopted sometime this year that will allow municipalities in the state to opt in to adopting a zero energy stretch code. Three states in the NEEP region are also on the path to adopting the zero energy base codes by 2030, Vermont, New York, and Massachusetts. Looking outside of the NEEP region, I'll give an example in California, they have already adopted numerous zero energy code requirements, including that all new residential construction must be zero net energy, and that in 2025, 50% 
of all new significant renovations of state buildings must be zero net energy. And we are seeing more states and municipalities look to increase the energy efficiency and resiliency of their buildings through the use of zero energy provisions. In code, especially as energy prices increase and new technologies are becoming cheaper and becoming more advanced. Although energy codes have typically um, only contained provisions for buildings to be zero energy, um, and have not contained provisions for buildings to be zero water or zero carbon, we are starting to learn more about how building to zero energy, water, and carbon is not only essential for the future of build buildings, but also can be achievable. And so with that, I will introduce today's first presenter, Jesse Burley, the Sustainability and Parking Manager of the Town of Breckenridge, Colorado. Great. Thank you, Andrea. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great. Thanks so much, Jesse. Thank you all for your, the opportunity to, to share our experience here in Breckenridge, Colorado. Um, we are, go ahead and advance the slide. Thank you very much. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about who we are as a community and, and why these codes end up, um, you know, fitting into some of our strategies and goals. But for those of you who are familiar, maybe aren't familiar with Colorado, we are about an hour and a half west of the city of Denver, and we are a resort ski community. Um, but historically, um, we were incorporated in the late 1800s, and so a lot of our buildings, and in fact, all of our downtown core is listed as a um, national historic uh, region, and we have a lot of um, conservation-oriented uh, codes in both our development code and the building codes. Um, our first sustainable building code was adopted in 2007. Um, it was pretty basic, um, but we really recognized the need to bring our buildings kind of uh, not just up to speed, but in terms of new construction, really kind of trying to push the envelope. Um, we adopted our first sustainable BREC plan in 2011. It was, it was pretty advanced for mountain communities like ours. And it included things like housing, workforce housing and affordable housing, child care, um, and then habitat protection, in addition to the typical sustainability things that you see like resource conservation, energy efficiency, things like that. So from that housing um, segment in the sustainable BREC plan spun off a, a workforce housing division within the town of Breckenridge um, that has a goal to house 47% of our workforce within the community. It's both a sustainability goal, but also it's an economic development goal. We don't want our neighboring jurisdictions to be bedroom communities for our workforce. We want people to live and work and experience the community in, in, in which they're, they're providing economic benefit to. Um, in 2017, the town council adopted a renewable electricity uh, goal for our municipal facilities. We are um, about halfway to that goal right now and are working really closely in partnership with our investor owned utility, Excel Energy, which is our sole utility provider um, for electricity. We also have a goal of balancing 37% of our resident housing with 65% vacation. Um, and the reason for that is we have a lot of short-term rentals up here. And so it's, it, it, it's a challenge to work with absentee owners, um, and in trying to, to reach some of these energy goals. Uh, a lot of our homes are custom homes. They're not your standard, you know, 2000 square foot, um, average build. These are upwards sometimes of 10,000 square feet. So they're very, very, very large homes. So all that kind of wrapped up um, to the project that I'm gonna talk about today, and that's our Alta Verde project, which um, is a workforce housing project targeting 60% uh, of the area median income. And uh, we wanted it to be our first all electric, um, zero net energy building for workforce housing in Breckenridge. And next slide. So some of our community challenges, as I mentioned, we don't want our other communities to be bedroom communities, but in general, Summit County, where we are located, has a need um, for a lot of different uh, housing types, from ownership to rentals, um, low income, median, medium income. In Breckenridge, we have recognized we need 14 
hundred homes by 2023. Um, the, the vast majority of those need to be rentals and low rates and affordable costs. We've also completed our climate action plan um, and it, greenhouse gas inventory. The most recent was in 2021. Uh, two thirds, this is probably no surprise to this group, two thirds of our emissions are generated by buildings. Um, and two thirds of those, that, those emissions are from um, electricity, of course, and natural gas. So we also recognize that our low income populations obviously have a higher exposure to um, health hazards and risks. And so we really tried to to build that into the concept at Alta Verde. Um, and, and then of course, it was kind of our first foray into net zero construction. Um, one thing to note now with Excel Energy is that they that we will be having a pretty significant natural gas um, increase starting this month. Um, and we'll see that 54% natural gas increase by December. And so it's another reason why we're really trying to shift our focus into electrification and trying to get off that natural gas because of its volatility and, and increasing prices. Next slide. So the town of Breckenridge is a jurisdiction. We, we adopt our building codes uh, two years after the model codes that Andrea just mentioned, but we also do, do it in conjunction with our neighboring jurisdictions and the county. Um, we feel like it helps the builders have some consistency across jurisdictions, um, and it also helps us uh, just have better communication across all of the building departments and community development. So we adopted our most recent code set in 2020, so we are on the 2018 code set. Um, but we really wanted to push, again, as I mentioned, we had a stretch energy goal from 2007. Uh, we adopted a, an updated one in 2012, and here we are um, trying to continue to, to meet some of our community um, energy and affordability goals. And so when we went out to our stakeholders in this most recent process, we kind of asked three questions. The first is, did we want to create our own stretch code or use an already existing code? Did we want to address just the residential sector, which was historically what we had done in the past? or did we want to address commercial too? And then um, in Breckenridge, we have like other, um, I would say affluent resort communities. We use a lot of, we have a lot of amenities that are energy intensive that heat the outdoors. So whether that's snow melt, pools, spas, um, things like that, we have a lot of energy use in the outdoors. And so the third question we posed to our stakeholders was do we wanna just address buildings or do we wanna address the outdoor energy use as well. Um, and so the answers to those questions were, we wanted to adopt an already existing code that was gonna try to get us to net zero by 2030, which was identified in our climate action plan. We are addressing residential and commercial, and eventually we're gonna get to the outdoor energy use, but we're not there yet. Next slide, please. So that brings us to the case study I wanted to highlight. Alta Verde is a workforce housing project that is, um, in, it's a public private partnership. We're gonna have phase one is 80 units at less than 60% AMI. Um, this is located just to the north of our um, more densely populated uh, downtown core. The, the nice thing about these sites is that they had a little bit more flexibility in terms of zoning um, related to what kind of architecture architectural styles we were able to use. So we really were able to design this site to, um, to net zero right from the beginning. And phase two, you can see here some of the stats. We're going to increase the number of units that area median income we're targeting is a little different. There will be rental and ownership in phase two as opposed to just rental. Um, and then the, the key here for us was that we did not lay any natural gas to the site. So all heating and power is, um, is, is electrically sourced. And all of the PV that uh, gets us to net zero is located on site for these facilities. Um, so we are in the process of building phase two right now. Phase one will CO and be occupied by December 1st of this year. Um, it was also the first project that we did after we adopted the Zero Energy Ready Home Program. So phase one was largely um, exploring the opportunities for electrification. 
We use the prescriptive pathway within zero energy ready homes. Um, the, the net zero piece is on a net annual basis. I do wanna just acknowledge that. Um, and the mechanical systems were largely built around heat pumps um, related to heating. And I don't have a ton of the details for all the mechanical systems. So if you have questions about those, I'm happy to follow up with the designers on that. But phase two kind of pivoted a little bit and mostly because we doubled in size and, or really more than doubled in size. And we were having a hard time fitting all that PV on site. And so they shifted a little bit from a prescriptive pathway to looking at more of a performance-based model. Um, they put a lot more time and energy on the building envelope versus the type of mechanical systems that they were using. So instead of heat pumps, they're actually back to electric resistance, but with that tightened um, building envelope piece. And so they were able to decrease the overall energy consumption and then offset it with PV and that helped them bring down the amount of PV that they needed on that, um, on that second phase of the building. Next slide, please. And then finally, this is just a snapshot of what we feel like is the most important part of all of this. Not only are we getting to net zero, but because these projects are targeted at low and moderate income households, the long-term affordability for this, these buildings were the most important part. And the town was willing to step in and help um, subsidize a little bit of the, the increased cost to get to net zero in exchange for the savings over time. And so this is specifically for phase two, but you can see that um, in having the PV on site, we only pay our utility for the, uh, basically for the solar demand charges and the connection. Um, and then in the middle two columns under the typical utility allowance, this is what the, um, the uh, HUD utility allowance schedule projects for the size of the apartments at the, um, at the rental rates that we're, that we're uh, using in the pro forma. And then you can see over on the right-hand side what we estimate the, um, the difference or the savings are that get passed on to the tenants of those apartments. So this was really important at the end of the day because as the town was looking at these projects and saying, great, what is the cost benefit for us to you know, put all this extra money towards net zero? <clears throat> what is the payback for the residents? And we really feel like um, we, we got our money's worth out of that. So um, with that, that's just a brief overview of how we got to zero energy ready homes and one of the projects that we have going on in Breckenridge. And um, look forward to taking questions at the end. Thank you all for letting us share our story. Thanks so much, Jesse. Really appreciate it and really exciting to see all the good stuff that Breckenridge is doing as someone who loves to ski, especially in Breckenridge. It's always good to see. I do have one quick question for you before we dive into our next presenter. Um, so what are your alternatives to natural gas and how long do you think it will take to completely replace this energy source in Breckenridge? So we, because we have one utility, we're, we, we basically work, um, you know, on, unless we are transitioning locally, which we are trying to do with, you know, on a project by project basis. So we're primarily using PV, solar PV. Um, we are a little bit on the utility schedule, right? So we do things like supporting the clean energy power plan um, when Excel Energy goes to the Public Utilities Commission, for example. And um, it's communities like ours that have set those 100% renewable energy goals that have helped Excel Energy recognize how many communities are demanding that of them. And so they're having to fast track a little bit more of their, of their projects. But so natural gas, um, and we do have coal, coal fired power and quite a bit of wind on the grid um, with Excel. I believe right now their official renewable um, sources are at 35% uh, across their grid in Colorado. I, so I, I think that answers the question. Um, and if not, I can clarify at the end. Great, that sounds good. Thank you so much. And I will now call up um, our next presenter, Mike calling on the Executive Director of Green Builder Coalition. So hi, Mike, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Andrea. <laughs> All right, and I will get started with your slides. All right.
Awesome, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, as she said, my name is Mike Ligman. I am the executive director of the Green Builder Coalition. I'm also the chair of the Water Efficiency Rating Score Development Group and the co-founder of the Next Generation Water Summit, but you didn't really come here to listen to what I am. You listen. You want to listen to what I have to say about water. So um, I think we can kind of, it's great that I'm following Jesse on the zero energy because my question has always kind of been, can we achieve zero energy if we're not also zero water? Because some of you are familiar with the energy water nexus, um, and so that kind of brings us to another philosophical question. Can we achieve zero water if we're not also zero energy? Now, uh, I don't want anybody to be alarmed, but I do have a, a little bit of a hobby as a hacker. And so I'm able to actually tap into your cameras to kind of gauge your response as an audience to see like, you know, how it's going because it's hard in some of these virtual things. So um, just see if I can work this right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So sometimes this is kind of a mind blowing concept of the zero energy, wait, it's gotta be zero water. No, it's gotta be zero energy and it goes back and forth. So uh, let's get into this a little bit. So, and I promise I will try not to wield the hacking power too often in this presentation, but according to the EIA, the entire grid in the US reduced their water usage 10 and a half percent in 2020 which is great. It sounds fantastic. Now, yes, there's a pandemic woven into that and, you know, uh, people weren't going into offices and they were at home more and all this other stuff. But on the whole, reducing water usage, okay, cool. That's great. So what does that really mean as far as how much water are we talking about here? Okay. So that's 47 and a half trillion gallons. Now, that's a huge number, and it's kind of hard to comprehend. So I thought, well, okay, maybe we'll try and uh, boil this down a little bit lower. So uh, I happen to be out at uh, the Water Smart Innovations Conference right now. I'm, I'm out here in Vegas. And so to give you a little bit of a, of a better example here of um, how much water that is, Las Vegas on an annual basis uses 178, about 170 and a half billion gallons of water in a year. So uh, we would need roughly 266 Las Vegas's. That's, that's about how much the entire grid uses for gallons of water. Now, again, we're still navigating in big numbers. So let's see if we can drill this down a little bit more. On a per kilowatt hour basis, that means we're only using 11.9 gallons per kilowatt hour. That's on average the U.S. grid. Now, you go, whoa, that's, uh, that's still a lot of water. And the reduction that we talked about earlier, the 10.5%, was that because of uh, increased energy efficiency, uh, maybe increased water efficiency? What was that really tied to? Well, it was actually tied to Moving away from coal, <laughs> that was the largest reason that we reduced our water usage. So as we continue to move away from coal, we'll continue to drive some of that water usage down on the electrical grid, um, which is great for a number of reasons. Obviously, uh, we're gonna hear about zero carbon here in just a little bit. That's another reason. So if we go on and kind of look at this, um, what I'm alluding to is that source matters, okay? so. Here's some breakdowns of how much water is used per kilowatt hour produced, coal versus natural gas. And you can see that it's about a tenth when you move to natural gas. Now, some of you might be saying, hey, what about renewable? Well, unfortunately, the EIA didn't have that information, but you can see from the chart that renewables are, uh, you know, a growing usage of our, or a growing source of our electrical uh, power. And they have a very low water usage uh, per kilowatt hour. I don't know the exact number. I wish I did. I would tell you, but I don't. But it is very low. So that's the good news. But there's also something else to consider. And this is a little bit geeky, but we're going to talk about it anyway. And that is that method matters. So there are closed loop systems uh, for, for electrical power. Um, there's also dry or hybrid systems. 
And both of those are much more water efficient ways to produce power. But the once through systems, which does include coal, is still about 23%. Now that has dropped from 27% down to 23% recently, but we're still seeing that method of electric production and that is very water intensive. So as we continue to transition away from that, we should also be able to uh, reduce the water usage on the electrical side. Now, excuse me, you say, wait a minute, you talked about a closed loop system here. Uh, isn't the water cycle a closed loop system? And the answer is yes, yes it is. The thing that is important to remember is that you're, you're not gonna gain or lose water because it's a closed loop system. But the issue that we're running into is the water isn't where we would like it to be, where we need it to be, where we want it to be. Um, specifically on this particular graphic, I wanna point out near the bottom, the groundwater storage aspect of this. As we lose water to evaporation, as temperatures rise, we don't get the chance to throw that water down into the ground for storage where it doesn't evaporate as much. And I say, well, wait a minute, if it doesn't evaporate as much, what about rain? Don't worry, there'll still be enough water for rain. But also healthy soils, and it's just, the system doesn't work as well if we, if we don't do some of these other things. And to show you just a couple of examples of how the system doesn't work very well, Anybody like to go fishing, you're running into some issues there. Uh, if you like to farm <laughs> or agriculture, um, this shows the Ogallala Aquifer. Say that five times real fast. But it is a largely the, the irrigation source for the breadbasket in the Midwest. And as you can see, I know it's kind of small, but as you can see, those numbers are dropping as we continue to pull more water out of there. And as we continue to see more droughts, I didn't put the drought monitor map in this um, presentation, but if you go to the drought monitor website, which is a fantastic resource, they update it every week and it actually gets updated on Thursdays, um, you will see just how dire it is out there. This is talking about underground and see you can see how dire that is. Also, if you like to, uh, you know, say, let's say go boating, um, especially out in the West, uh, well, you're getting smaller and smaller areas to boat. Clearly, that is not what that area is supposed to look like. Um, also, if you have ever driven around in like Central California, um, there's the Don Pedro Reservoir, um, which I think is on the next slide. Yep, uh, that is clearly lower than it should be. Um, and I have driven past that a couple times. It is uh, frankly kind of depressing to see just how low that has gotten. And you say, well, okay, you're pulling out all these uh, examples of the West. Okay, fine. Um, it isn't just a West thing. This is Lake Lanier. Um, now, this is from 07. You say, oh, that's old news, man. But here's the thing about that, is that this isn't a recent thing either. So it's, it's timely, yet it's, we've seen this before. It's not just a Western problem. And so I kind of want to reiterate to this national audience that the whole topic of water is not just something that can be dismissed as, ah, it's a Western problem. And, and I see that a decent amount, um, and I don't really uh, buy that and then try to convey that when I can. So, okay, let's talk about zero water policies or net zero water policies. Um, uh, well, the good news is I, I put my researcher, Frank, on the task of finding net zero water policies um, in the U.S. And so we're going to we're going to tap into his camera real quick here and see how he's. Oh, yeah. So he's he's still trying. He's still trying to find those zero water policies because they just really aren't out there. And, and I know you might feel bad for Frank um, now, but uh, you know, probably feel even worse because this is what he looked like when he started looking for zero water policies. Um, now, here's the goodness. OK, uh, all jokes aside, there, there are some. There are some ways and some places that are trying to get there. Um, now, it might be on paper, meaning that you can buy offsets or you can secure additional water rights, but functionally, there really isn't anything yet. Now, in a bit of uh, a preview of coming I mean, attractions, I mean, an on-gaze presentation, which is next, uh, a place like Kansas City Water, 
has stated uh, has a stated goal of going net zero carbon by 2040. So you got a water utility saying, "Oh, net zero carbon, great." But uh, the net zero water thing is a, still a bit of a challenge. Yes, there are uh, voluntary ways, um, voluntary uh, programs, uh, green building programs. There are maybe some incentives um, to do some piecemeal things. But and we'll get to those in just a moment. But uh, on the whole, saying, okay, we're going to go, like like uh, Jesse talked about earlier with net zero energy, there really isn't a net zero water policy in place anywhere yet. Um, so is the issue because we don't know how to do this? Well, no. Um, I was able to hack into the, uh, the NASA camera, and you can see this is the International Space Station, and we just sent a crew up there yesterday. Um, they should be arriving there in just the next few hours. Um, oh, hey, look, there's somebody waving at us now. You know, what's interesting is that person sent me a note and said, hey, uh, we're in that zero water already up here. Because they're waving to say hi to us. They're not waving uh, to welcome the new crew. They're not waving to welcome the water truck showing up. They're able to survive on zero water up there. Now, I can already hear a response of, well, yeah, but they don't have a lawn. They don't have irrigation needs up there. And that's a good point. But I also know of uh, a builder who I consider a friend who has been building uh, net zero energy and water in the hill country of Texas for years. And not just single homes, a development scale, a neighborhood level, and enough water capture to also deal with fire suppression. So we can do this. It's not really a technical thing, okay? So where is uh, where are we trying to make some headway? We're trying to make some headway, again, kind of on a piecemeal thing. And I'm not knocking it. It's better than nothing, right? But you're talking about policies that do things like require water sense fixtures or at least the, the flow rates that you see uh, asked for in water sense. And there's 14 states and the District of Columbia that have adopted some kind of uh, requirement for these fixtures. Now, what's interesting in that number of 14 is that it's not consistent, okay? Some of the states have said, okay, all fixtures. Some of the states have said, uh, for some of the fixtures. Um, some of them are point of sale, some of them are new construction. So there's a bit of a mixed bag out there, but at least they're moving in that direction. Uh, the city of Santa Fe, I have many uh, friends who work out there, live out there, and I work with them, um, who, They've said, the city has said, okay, we're going to say you have to get a, a water rating, which is a performance-based approach, um, and you have to get a certain level, a score, um, or lower than that, um, in order just to get a permit. And then you have to come back and confirm that number or something even lower than that um, when you go get your certificate of occupancy. So that's an approach that can be taken. Um, but again, I mentioned it before, here it is here, the incentives part um, with the Vermont Energy Code. They've got their prescriptive plus points. Water efficiency is one of the many choices in their points table. Uh, city of Santa Barbara, California, uh, if you want to build multifamily and you want to use sub-metering, then they say, okay, then you have to demonstrate that you are going to be very water efficient and, and here's a way you can comply with this code. Um, and then the other thing you see a lot is just product rebates, right? Uh, oh, we'll give you a discount on shower heads or toilet retrofits or or uh, we'll hand out aerators like it's Halloween candy or we'll we'll pay you to remove your turf. Um, all these things are out there, but again, they're all just kind of one-off piecemeal. There's really not an incentive program that I've found yet that says, okay, we're going to look at the entire property and we're going to kind of let you do whatever is appropriate for you in, in your location or your property. But as long as you reach a certain level of efficiency or you reach all the way to, to zero water. So it's we're like I said, we're kind of getting there. You say, well, why aren't we doing this? Well, in my opinion, the biggest hurdle is cash. It's money. And it's not money on the, oh my God, it's so expensive. Okay. I'm not saying that reuse systems like rainwater and gray water systems, black water systems. Um, they're not expensive. Well, instead, what I'm saying is, where is the financial incentive? Because you're, we, we subsidize water because it's a vital resource, okay? And, and that's fine. We all need water to live. 
and then and every living thing needs water to live. So you don't want to sit there and charge exorbitant rates and have people go, oh, well, I can't afford it. So there's this kind of balance between, okay, we have to make it affordable and accessible for everybody to live. At the same time, what we charge for water doesn't typically cover what it actually costs. It's We kind of deflate that price. So where that comes back to bite us is on the bill. So you pay your bill and you're like, ah, my water bill isn't that much. I'll give you my own example from my own home. My water bill is typically in the 70s, $70, you know, $70, $75 a month. Um, I don't irrigate um, and we live pretty water efficiently. Surprise, surprise. Um, But if you say, oh, I can help you cut your bill 10%, that's seven bucks a month. Most people are going to go, wow, great. Seven bucks a month. Whereas if you take your energy bill and you say, okay, uh, I'll give you, you know, you can do things to take 10% off of that. And your energy bill is typically around 200 or maybe 250. Now 10% of that is 20 to 25 a month. Whoa, that that seems like more dollars, more real dollars, a bigger savings. And certainly it is three times as much. But that's also kind of my point is that the, the financial motivator isn't quite there on water like it is on energy. And that kind of really makes this a bit of a challenge. So that's, I'm not trying to advocate for, okay, let's start uh, jacking up water prices. And, and, and by the way, my example is not endemic of the entire water industry. You've got water rates all over the place out there. You've got some that are very high and water efficiency is very valued. And you've got some places where it's lower and people just do not care. And and then you've got some people, like you get some places where it may be the, uh, a little bit more affluent and they're like, I don't care what the water bill is. I want a green lawn or I want fruit trees or I, you know, whatever it is. And they're just going to pay it no matter what the price is. So uh, the economics of it becomes a bit of a challenge. Now, <clears throat> It all boils down to this, net zero water. Can we achieve it? Well, yeah, yeah, we can achieve it. Uh, if, if a couple of things. One, if we work together, um, and when I say work together, I'm talking about um, breaking down some of the silos that exist. And I've, I've talked with people at this conference about it too, is, is, you know, does land use planning talk to the water utility? No. Oh, okay. Does the energy utility talk to the water utility? Well, if they're not the same, no. You know, like, it, it, you know, there, there's not a lot of communication. So we need to kind of work together on some of this. I think um, the other part of this is embracing technology. And it's not like technology is necessarily going to all the way save us, but it is going to sit there and say, okay, how can we reuse water? Uh, how can we be more efficient? That's got to be in this mix of getting to zero water. And then I think the final thing is, and I, you know, just spent a little bit of talking about it, is having a new perspective on water and saying, you know what, this is a vital resource. It's worth more than what we really uh, charge for it now. And and what can we do to value it more? And at the same time, understand that. We can go to net zero energy, but there's still a water component to that. And we can look at net zero energy on a house scale or residential scale, property scale, but there's infrastructure involved too. And so with that, I uh, kind of conclude my my talk for now, but uh, welcome any questions either now or later and uh, appreciate the time very much. Thanks so much, Mike. Really appreciate it and really always love to hear about trying to break down silos. I mean, we can definitely feel it on the energy code side where departments don't always talk to each other and things like that. So it can be a little frustrating with that. I do have a comment if you want to quickly uh, talk to it that I just got in the chat. And so it says that in some locations, sewage charges are two times that of water charges. If rainwater was used for toilets only, that would reduce both water and sewer costs. And you are oh, mute. Sorry. Yep. 
Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. And I think that's also um, a topic that the water industry, and you know, that's a very broad statement, uh, both the water efficiency industry, the water utility industry, sometimes they grapple with that of saying, okay, well, what about reduced flows? Okay, what does that mean economically, but also reduced flows on the system, right? Can it, can it, um, without getting too gross here, uh, can, do we have enough water in the system to move the solids if we're going to be so efficient? And it's something that I, I know can be figured out. It just takes people sitting down to figure it out. So, so to the point about the economics of, yeah, sewer charges, I, I see you that on my own bill too. I'm sure many of you as well. Um, we go, oh, well, if you're, if you're reusing the water, then you don't, uh, you don't incur the sewer. So how do I get rewarded for that? Um, and I think there's ways that, that we can kind of figure that out. Um, it just, it just takes working through it. That's all it is. It's not insurmountable. Great. Well, thank you so much. And we will see you again in a little bit. I will now call up our final presenter, uh, Enonge Mubita from, uh, the International Living Future Institute. Thank you. Um, and hi, everyone. My name is Anange, as Andrea mentioned. Um, I work at ILFI as a manager, um, mostly supporting projects pursuing our zero energy and zero carbon certification. Um, but I just want to first start off kind of giving a general overview of what ILFI does. Um, so ILFI operates a number of programs to implement its mission to take an ecosystem approach to the built environment. Um, we have a host of certifications and labels for teams to choose from and meet their goals. These include the Living Building Challenge, uh, which is the first involuntary building certification program. Um, we also have the Living Community Challenge and the Living Product Challenge that take on the same philosophy behind the LBC and apply it to a scale of certifying communities and manufactured products. Then the Zero Carbon Certification, Zero Energy Certification, and Core Green Building Certification programs kind of offer additional certification pathways for projects to be recognized for their good work in energy and carbon and green building in general that goes above and beyond other codes and standards. And then finally, we have our Declare, Just, and Reveal platforms, which are trans transparency reporting tools for building product ingredient disclosure organizational um, social justice and equity initiatives, and building energy use and disclosure. Um, so while our programs are voluntary, our mission is to really help create resources, demonstrate what is possible in partnership with project teams and other stakeholders to grow a powerful community of advocates and ho hopefully you know, push for a better policy. So if you want to learn more about our plans for growth and our other programs, you know, feel free to look at our website and our strategic plan. Um, but for the purpose of this conversation, I'm going to focus on zero carbon. Um, so Andre, you can move to the next slide. Yeah, so our zero carbon program was created as a valuable tool for organizations to demonstrate credible climate action through their built projects. Um, it requires project teams to demonstrate measured carbon neutrality in the project's operational and embodied carbon emissions. Uh, so it's kind of surrounded, structured around three key strategies, which is to reduce operational and embodied carbon em emissions from design optimi optimization, the use of efficient combustion-free building systems, and the responsible selection of materials. Materials. Uh, and just to provide a definition, uh, embodied carbon are the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the extraction, manufacturing, and transport of building materials to the construction site. And then secondly, uh, to disclose the actual energy consumption of the building and the embodied carbon of the installed materials and construction process. And finally, to offset all carbon emissions associated with the project through the procurement of renewable energy, carbon sequestering materials, and carbon offsets. Uh, so next slide. And so why this is important is because of the building sector's impact on the environment. Uh, so while the green building sector is, you know, primarily focused on designing energy efficient buildings run by renewables, which is very important, uh, there's also a great need to address the embodied carbon of a building. And so as you can see from this graph, um, in total, 39% of global CO2 emissions are from building operations and building materials and construction. And you can see that 11% of that is from materials and construction. And so that's kind of the goal of our ZT program is to, you know, make sure we're acknowledging both the operational and embodied emissions. So next slide. 
Uh, and I'm just gonna speak a bit to specific requirements for a zero carbon certification um, on the operational side. So the LFI zero carbon certification measures operational carbon by examining 12 months of performance data once the building is fully occupied. So that's what makes our program a little bit different is that we're more focused on performance. Um, and then this data should must demonstrate a reduction in energy used. And then the project team will need to demonstrate that the remaining energy used has been offset with installed or procured renewable energy. Um, and then next slide, please. And then also looking at the embodied carbon, similar to the similar to the requirements for operational carbon, uh, there needs to be a proven carbon reduction in what ILFI calls primary materials, so the or the materials that make up most of the structural elements, including the foundation and the outside of the building. Um, ILFI accepts a variety of documentation for measuring this reduction, and it'll look different in different places. So. An example might be procuring local FSC certified timber um, beams instead of shipping steel beams from another continent. And then in both new and existing buildings, you'll need to disclose a measurement of your total embodied carbon or the life cycle assessment tool. And then finally, as you did for your operational carbon, uh, you'll need to offset your embodied carbon, generally done through a carbon offset purchase that is third party verified. Uh, next slide, please. And so I'm just going to provide a general um, kind of some key process elements to designing a low carbon project. Um, so a key tool and process in calculating and comparing low embodied carbon materials are is through a life cycle assessment. Um, so teams are required to use an LCA tool or a calculator that can complete a whole building life cycle assessment to calculate the aggregated carbon emission impacts. And you can find, you know, if you're interested, you can find a list of approved tools on our site. Um, we require teams to complete an LCF stages A1 to A5. So this is the product and construction stage. So from the extraction to the installation of that material, primarily of the primary material. So foundation, structure, and enclosure as those have the highest impact. Um, so we are more focused on kind of those primary materials, but also require teams to show, you know, using lower embodied carbon materials for the other interior materials. Um, and then the team will need to calculate the embodied carbon baseline. Um, so that's how you're gonna show that, that reduction. So the baseline would reflect the building design that is identical to the proposed design with the exception of the claimed reduction measures. And then you'll conduct an LCA of the actual proposed design with those reduction measures and show that 10% reduction or at least a minimum 10% reduction. Um, and then you also want to specify for low carbon materials and optimize building assemblies, um, which you can do with the help of an LCA calculator. Um, and then I'll say next slide, please. Um, so the reuse of key structural materials is a great way also to reduce embodied carbon. Um, but on the slide, I'm going to focus on some of the other kind of information you'll need. Um, so building optimizing for building assemblies um, is another key part of, uh, and as I mentioned, for the, and you can do that in LCA. Uh, we also encourage teams to request product-specific EPDs. Uh, EPDs are environmental product declarations and are critical for understanding the environmental impacts of a material and can help serve uh, for more transparency, which is what ILFI strives for, to have more transparency in the market. And an EPD will provide information about a product's impacts such as their global warming potential, smog creation, ozone depletion, and water pollution. Um, so if you notice, you know, if there's a material you're looking for, which you can normally find through these LCA calculators or tools, if you notice it doesn't have an EPD, um, you know, request them from your manufacturers or always encouraging teams to request information from their manufacturers because um, it always helps to at least ask, because as, as more teams request for better quality EPDs, um, we can have more accurate and current information and the building and industry can build its environmental impact database. Um, and also manufacturers will be incentivized to be more transparent with their products. And then next slide, please. And so here's the infographic um, from the Climate, Climate Pledge Arena. Um, Climate Pledge Pledge Arena, as some of you may be aware, is based in Seattle and has a goal of being zero carbon. And they created a really nice uh, infographic to kind of show some of their key strategies um, to address bo both the operational and embodied carbon um, impacts of the of the project. And so, on the operational side, you'll see, you know, creating for low carbon all electric 
building systems and replacing those, replacing all combustion-based systems with electric, um, and then meeting all the energy needs with renewable electricity. Then you'll see on the embodied carbon ash side, reuse is a very big integral part of um, reducing embodied carbon. We always really encourage the reuse of structural materials and also preserving um, some of those historic elements and then um, offsetting uh, the remaining carbon with either reforestation projects or renewable energy investments that are third party verified. And then next slide, please. Um, so I'm just going to share some projects that achieve zero carbon certification. Uh, we have the Archimania 663 Cooper Street, uh, which is based in Memphis, Tennessee, and it's a certified zero carbon and zero energy project. Um, the project had a you know, very key focus on place, energy efficiency, and carbon neutrality, and reuse was a very integral part of the Archimania office. The team was able to upcycle the existing concrete and terrazzo floor, steel structure and exterior masonry while incorporating new materials with high recycled content and or locally sourced materials. And this allowed them to achieve a 67% reduction in body carbon from a conventional new build. And so with this, the team was able to demonstrate the potential for carbon neutral and human-centered commercial districts through intentional design and reuse. Um, next slide, please. And another um, ZC certified project is the Google Panker Square, which is located in London. Uh, it's actually one of the first projects to gain zero carbon certification. Um, the, the zero carbon certification is relatively new. It was released in 2018. Um, so we only have about four projects that actually achieved um, ZC certification, but we have a number of ZC ready projects um, and projects that are you know, in the process of achieving or um, getting certification. And so this project specifically um, is a really great example for designing for flexibility and adaptability to accommodate different users. So kind of going back to the importance of building assemblies, it's not only important to just look at having sustainable materials, but also how you design the building to reduce impact. And so the team's main, main strategies um, were to design for flexibility, to design for reuse and maximize recycled content, as well as use locally sourced materials and reuse appropriate building material, existing building materials. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. And so and I'm just going to speak generally on some of the opportunities and barriers. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot happening in the embodied carbon world, both in terms of opportunities and some still existing challenges. Um, one of them being that there's a growing interest in development of tools to help teams quantify and design for low embodied carbon, which is very critical. Um, so again, going back to life cycle assessment, um, there are more tools being developed in order to conduct those LCAs and meet specific project needs. And then in addition to those tools, there are more resources available. So um, there are platforms like the Carbon Leadership Forum that some of you may be aware of. It's a group of practitioners aiming to, to transform the building sector um, to reduce embodied carbon. Um, they have a number of resources. They have community hub groups. You know, So if you're interested in finding one in your area, finding resources and toolkits that address embodied carbon, I'd highly recommend looking at the Carbon Leadership Forum. Um, then there's also some work being done at the policy level, um, not as much as we'd love to, but you know this it's coming, uh, such as the California Buy Clean. So this is a um, a climate policy that was has low carbon construction purchasing requirements to address the greenhouse gas emissions from construction materials into government purchasing. So hoping to see more, and I'm sure there are more examples um, that I you know. So please feel free to share if you know some other kind of work being done at the policy level, um, especially when it comes to purchasing of, you know, low carbon materials. And then um, there's still some challenges. So one of the challenges um, is, you know, having available data. Um, in order to quantify and verify the actual emission impacts uh, of materials, you'll need EPDs. You'll need some form of transparency and understanding um, what the actual impact of this material is from its extraction um, to at least its construction. So at least for that, you know, those that product and construction stage. Um, so continuing to encourage teams and encourage manufacturers to develop those EPDs for all of their products. 
Um, I'd say another challenge would be creating specific targets, uh, particularly for interior projects. You know, our focus has been on new builds, um, but there also needs to be guidance for existing and interior projects, especially to incentivize and encourage um, kind of retrofit projects towards low embodied carbon design because they already have the opportunity to reuse what is already there. So continuing to incentivize those projects um, to, you know, reuse what they have and to procure, you know, to kind of design for low and body carbon or renovate, you know. Um, and then I'll say another one is making embodied carbon a goal across the whole team. So in order to achieve ZC, everyone from you know, the architect, the project lead, contractors, everyone needs to be on board, um, especially because in order to tackle e embodied carbon, it really has to be done at the design stage. Um, it's something that's a little bit harder to implement once you've already constructed the building. And so everyone on your team needs to have a consensus and goal that you know embodied carbon is the goal that we wanna you know, implement for this project. Um, and I'm going to share some specific to ILFI. So we are in the process of energy and carbon tag. Um, two key focus areas regarding embodied carbon include setting building specific targets. So this is, you know, having interior reduction requirements and more guidance for existing buildings, as well as looking at carbon offsets, you know, ensuring carbon offsets are well verified or robust, as well as looking into innovative carbon offset approaches. And then the other kind of opportunity and challenge is how to scale zero carbon. How And so we've been working with kind of leading tech companies and real estate organizations like Google and Salesforce to align and implement our ZC certification across their global portfolio. And with that, um, I'll keep that. And thank you again for having me. Thanks so much, Ngong. I really appreciate it. And so I do have a question that came in that I think would be interesting if you took a stab at first, and then I will call up Jesse and Mike to also uh, answer it if they're able. And so when talking about net zero, I'm curious to all of your thoughts and kind of processes in your own specific projects. Is it based on on-site energy or water consumption in the uh, for Mike? or on the source? Because if it's based on the source, how do you include power plant efficiency and other utility efficiency into the equations? So Nange, I'll start with you. Yeah, for the net zero, we do focus more on site energy consumption for the operational carbon. And we're hoping that some of that source energy is being captured in the embodied carbon. So in that environmental product declaration, it may specify whether you know this was this material is manufactured with renewable energy or coal, and it will, you know, incorporate that the impacts of that. But for the operational carbon site um, aspect, we're focused on site energy consumption and meeting that with renewable energy. Yeah, thanks for that question. It's sort of the first, sort of the first thing that we did when we identified our project and our goals. Um, you know, we told the development team, we want to be net zero. And they said, well, what does that mean to you? And so um, the fact that it was our very first project, we really focused it uh, to be on site. And we do know that over time, and I think this was getting at an earlier question, you know, over time, our utility is also getting cleaner. And so ultimately, um, yes, this is still 20 years in the future or whatever, but um, you know, ultimately our, our grid will also be clean. So even when the PV on site is not running, we're going to have much cleaner power on the grid side. But I think it's just important to define that and set your goal per project so that everyone, and to Anange's point about the whole development team and everybody on the project being, um, you know, recognizing what it is that you're trying to work towards. So in our case, it was on site energy, but I think as we evolve this program and we learn from it, um, we're going to start taking more of that, um, you know, source energy uh, on the grid into consideration as well. Yeah, I think for me, it depends on who's talking, right? Like if you're talking to uh, a homeowner or builder, then they're probably looking at it on a per property basis. Um, if you're talking to a developer, maybe they're looking at it on the development scale. And if you're talking to a utility, then that's a different scale. And so I think there's different, you know, different ways to measure it based on who's saying I'm net zero fill in the blank. 
Got it. Thank you. And I have one question that just came in for Jesse. Um, in phase two of the project that you were discussing, heat pumps would have lowered the energy use even more, but electric strip heat was chosen. Can you discuss more about why that decision was made? Yeah, the pro forma. I mean, it. They, it was cheaper. So they they were able to put the money towards the building envelope um, and really focus on, on tightening the building up to reduce the energy load. Um, and the heat pumps they found on phase one of the project were one of the more um, expensive elements of that system. So they just they just tried a different a, a different approach. And since it was more performance based, they were able to, you know, calculate the savings from different areas um, of the project instead of just on the mechanical systems alone. But it would it it came down to a, a cost benefit. Great, thank you. And so we've got about ten minutes more of uh, Q and A, and then I. Uh, Richard from DOE is going to be giving a quick spiel at the end. So I just want to give everyone a heads up of kind of where our timing is going. And so one question I'm going to ask all three of you as well is about how can zero energy water and carbon design principles in new buildings be translated into retrofitting or renovating existing buildings? So whoever would like to start. Um, um, I'll, I'll I'll talk. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, just briefly around kind of zero carbon, um, you know, evaluate what you can re reuse. Again, reuse is a really integral part of reducing your embodied carbon and try to optimize for that. Um, utilize life cycle design principles, you know, especially for the new additional materials you're going to be adding. Consider locally sourced materials, highly, you know, materials that are highly have a high recycled content. Um, and I also just want to share the carbon avoided estimator retrofitter that the um, CLF created. I, I don't think it's live yet, but it's kind of there to help compare impacts and benefits of reusing and upgrading existing buildings. So that could be a valuable tool. And then I kind of talked a little bit about it, um, about some of the rebates that are out there for, you know, some piecemeal stuff. Um, those obviously apply to existing properties. You can also supplement with, you know, additional uh, systems, um, whether that be, you know, saying, okay, I'm going to add a rainwater system, or maybe I'll add a gray water system, um, which is not a small undertaking, but can happen. Um, you can also say, I'm going to remove the irrigation system, um, which is also not a small undertaking either, but um, there are certainly steps you can take in existing properties to lower your water usage. And I think the one thing I never really hit on was behavior um, because that's gonna vary from person to person, but there are simple things and, and some not quite as simple, but not all bad. Um, or not too heavy of a lift of things you can do on a behavioral side to also just reduce your water usage too. You know, uh, the existing buildings, um, when we went through our stakeholder process to adopt our new codes, it was really a sticking point because we had folks in the room who were really pushing on, you know, why do we need to do this for new construction? We have all these old buildings in town and they're really the problem. Um, and so it really becomes kind of a two-pronged approach. Of course, new construction needs to be at the highest standard that it can be so that you can kind of, you know, eliminate those future emissions from your, from your inventory. But on the on the existing buildings, it's just a, it, it's a huge opportunity to um, engage with the community and educate homeowners. In Breckenridge, about a third of our facilities, our homes, I should say, um, are already electric resistant. So they're already on a electric heating um, element, and they were built in the late '70s and early '80s. So there's a lot of opportunity. Um, structurally to, to upgrade those. But we're also in a community that is very, you know, fairly affluent in, um, and so what that results in is people buy up old properties, scrape them and build new. 
So we have kind of this, we need to address the existing buildings certainly, but we're also seeing a lot of turnover in terms of scrapes and rebuilds where having those new codes in place, you know, kind of address that, um, that infill and turnover of buildings as well. Great, thank you. And I got two quick questions for Nange really quick. Um, is zero energy cert certification available from ILFI for single family homes? And then um, are there guides for embodied carbon in various materials to help choose wall or wall cladding systems that you've seen? Yeah, so definitely zero energy certification is avail available for single family homes. Um, I think we have a number of different types of residential, single and multifamily. Um, in regards to the second question, um, I would, again, I would recommend the Carbon Leadership Forum, as well as the kind of the life cycle assessment tools like Tally or EC3. And that's where you can make those comparisons a little bit more easier um, in terms of if you're trying to select what wall system to use. So that's where those LCA tools, you know, like Tally, um, EC3, it's, that's where you can kind of make those comparisons more easily. Great, thanks. And I did just drop the Carbon Leadership Forum car, uh, estimator into the chat for everybody to see. Uh, next up, I will ask a question to everybody. Um, do zero energy water, uh, zero energy water and carbon buildings require more maintenance once they are operational? Why or why not? And then kind of on top of that, are there people with the knowledge and the workforce to maintain these buildings throughout the US in your uh, experience with your individual projects? I'll try to answer that one. Um, so from a, mm, in terms of our particular project, we don't know yet, right? Because it's so new, but um, I think any time, Uh, any, you're, I, I do truly believe that you're improving, you know, your your building standards and, and making them better over the long term. Um, and and hopefully here in Climate Zone Seven, which is where Breckenridge is, we're gonna we're gonna see that play out. Um, and then I'm sorry, remind me of the second part of that question. So just asking about workforce and then kind of ongoing maintenance costs Thank and you. maintenance of them. Yeah. So the. The electrification portion of this going from heating with natural gas to heating with heat pumps, for example, we are very challenged with workforce in that arena. So we have, um, you know, a lot of custom home builders, a lot of small home builders, they are doing their best to keep up with the code. And so they're, they're learning, they're, they're doing the trainings, they are, they're getting up to speed, but then when it gets down to the, um, like the, perhaps, you know, on a commercial project or HVAC folks or, or the contractors who are doing the actual mechanical system installs, we're seeing, especially on the retrofit side where people are wanting to switch fuel sources, for example, they're getting really high bids or people won't call them back or it's just too busy or they don't have the know-how to do heat pumps. And so they recommend high efficiency boilers instead. Um, the workforce, it, we have pivoted now that we have the codes in place, it, it's sort of our next initiative is, is how do we really focus on the training piece for the workforce so that we, you know, as we push beneficial electrification, for example, or net zero energy, um, we are, we have the people to back that up and it is very much a challenge for us right now. Mike, do you uh, want to go I'll next? Just, yeah, I was going to say, how much time do we have here, Andrew? No, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, there's going to be increased maintenance because now the systems are on site, right? Like now you have to maintain the system as the property owner, um, as opposed to just relying on the utility, the municipality, or whomever. Um, so, I mean, that's a little bit of a concern on my part is, are the homeowners going to maintain them? But Kind of like Jesse was talking about. I think if, from what I've seen, if you get these things into either a code or an incentive that people will use, 
the workforce will follow. The labor force will follow. And, and you will have the people who will then say, okay, here's an opportunity for employment on maintaining these systems, installing these systems, um, troubleshooting, whatever. Um, so that's kind of the very brief answer on that one. Yeah, and I don't have much to add. I, I would agree. Finding workforce with the knowledge um, and kind of interest and awareness um, in order to kind of maintain these buildings. I know one of the biggest, one of the bigger challenges for some of our project teams is finding contractors who know how to do assessments or kind of who are as invested in embodied carbon or low embodied carbon. Um, that kind of comes up as a as a challenge. Great, and thank you all so much for your time and your presentations today. I we unfortunately are have run out of time for questions, but really appreciate all of the work that you're doing as well as presenting to everyone today. And hopefully we can get the ball rolling a little bit more with zero energy, water, and carbon. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Richard Fowler with um, the PNNL to give a quick overview of what's coming up with them. Yes, thank you, uh, Richard Fowler, jumping in here from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. On behalf of the Department of Energy, we want to extend a big thank you to our speakers today and to NEEP for hosting. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to meet with us. And thanks to all of you for participating. Uh, and then if you uh, see on the next slide, uh, also as mentioned in the beginning, this was the, the fourth event on our uh, in our seminar series. Uh, we encourage you to join us again for either or both of the final two events. On October 20th, we will be discussing the benefits of offsite construction. And November 17th, we will uh, be looking at options to advance multifamily building efficiency. Registration is now open for both of those webinars. And okay, uh, unless Anip or any of other, other speakers have any last minute words uh, they'd like to add, uh, that will do it uh, for today. Uh, thanks again, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day. That is it from us. Thank you so much, Richard, and thank you everybody for joining us today.